Okay, how about if we get started? I'm Vicki Christian. I know most of you, but um, I work in the Duke Translational Research Institute, which is the T1, or early translational uh, part, or hub, or pillar, depending on the nomenclature of the day, of the Duke Translational Medicine Institute. And uh, one of my roles as the uh, index employee of the Duke Translational Research Institute was to identify areas that were specified in the original grant uh, of particular concentration that required some recruitment of expertise uh, into roles that are classically thought of as project leadership roles. I, I've been a project leader in lots of different environments and uh, it's a, it's a, a very diverse um, sort of catch-all title, but in the case of molecular therapeutics and um, cell and molecular therapy development, it seemed to me to be important to identify somebody with a scientific background. So we set out within about a year of starting the DTRI to identify someone who could uh, come in and work with Bruce Selinger to develop this capability for um, investigational purposes here at Duke. Uh, I've discovered Virginia Burns, who was brought to me by Jesse Tenenbaum. Some of you probably know Jesse. Uh, Virginia, Jesse's husband was on the faculty at NC State in the chemistry department, and Jesse had come to um, know Virginia while she was a graduate student there, um, earning her PhD. We recruited Virginia before her PhD came through into a entry-level project leader role and uh, married her to, uh, professionally speaking only, to uh, Dr. Rebecca Haley, who comes from uh, a long multi-decade career in cellular therapies and with, with a deep regulatory background. Um, Dr. Haley was able to mentor Virginia, and Virginia was able to step up and do the, the sort of energetic, very scientifically granular and um, intense preparation of a space that we had uh, talked the Department of Surgery into letting us develop for them. So without saying too much more, I will say that when at the time that I recruited um, Virginia, she was also under consideration for a postdoc position in the Selinger lab. So the, the, the bifurcation of her career to, to gravitate in the direction of making things happen, working in, with investigators to leverage their ideas and sort of pour the steam on and provide them with the discipline and momentum to realize some of their research aspirations was what Virginia has been here and able to do really uh, in an extraordinary way. She's written uh, grant applications with investigators. She's brought sponsored research into the environment uh, by working with the commercial sector and her, her energy and sort of grasp of this realm that she's gonna talk about with us today is, is really extraordinary. So that said, come on up, Virginia. And uh, there will be a time, time for questions at the end. Yeah. Welcome, Virginia, with me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, they did mic me, so I'm going to try to remember not to use my lecturing voice so we won't blow out any eardrums. Um, really what I wanted to discuss today, or what I was asked to discuss, is translational research, especially within the cell and molecular therapy um, arena. And so I wanted to start off with this, this statement, which I hold dear, and it says, it is critical and, on, critical and ongoing importance to educate the research community on the translational process, number one, what resource, resources are available to facilitate their work, number two, and also how and when to access, utilize, and interface with those resources. So that being said, I have a couple of discussion topics that hopefully we're going to get through today, although in my typical style, I think I was a little over ambitious with my slide deck, so I'm going to try to go swiftly, but uh, not too quickly. Um, first of all, I'm going to give a brief overview to just discussing what is translational research and really understanding uh, T1 research. 
uh, what comprises T1 research, and how investigators have classically built teams to enable that, that area. Um, then I'm going to spend some time surveying the existing landscape of resources here at Duke. Um, these are going to include some shared resource facilities, also things like the DCRU, which is a phase one clinic that DTMI has enabled um, under the direction of John Sunday, who's sitting here today. Um, and we, I also want to make sure that um, everyone is aware of how and to access these facilities and how to learn more about them. So you're, I've tried to uh, identify a point person as we go through the slides. And don't worry, um, if I have my email address at the end if you have any interest in having a copy of the slide deck um, so that you can get the contact information and review letter, just send me an email or you can email the DTRI project office and we'll make sure to get that to you. All right, and then at the end, I'm hoping to have time to highlight some of the really innovative work that's being done within this area here at Duke. So that being said, I think most people have probably seen this slide before, and it's um, translational research defined as going from the bench to the clinic and then into the community. And really what we focus on, as uh, Victoria Christian mentioned, is that first block, or the T1 as it's often called, which is really taking drugs after they're identified or lead compounds, doing drug development, and getting the regulatory pathway understood and check that box and then move into phase one studies. So that's really the area I'm going to focus on today because that's where um, my work has been focused. So um, it's really important to understand the, the milestones and the hurdles involved in pursuing T1 research. So um, this just illustrates it a little bit, saying that you might have a, a library of compounds or some kind of approach that you're going to screen and you're going to identify a lead. After that, you have to do in vitro models to show efficacy, it's usually the first step, followed by animal models that would be able to indicate the efficacy in a, in a live system. And then after that, you have to take that compiled data and submit from our IND or an investigational new drug application so that you can get regulatory clearance to put it into first in man studies. Okay? So really what that means for an investigator is there's a whole host of expertise involved. So if you're a clinician or you're a basic science person, you might not understand every intricate part of the process. So for example, project management is often needed to move the project from step to step and identify those resources that you need to tap into in order to move your project forward. Um, you're going to have to find sources of funding. R01 and R21 funding is not um, classically supportive of translational research in this phase, in this realm, meaning those high-priced GLP animal talk studies and GMP manufacturing. You're going to have to learn um, there's going to be an optimization step for most drugs, which is going to be iterative testing, tweaking, and back to testing again. There's going to be a preclinical development, which might also be an iterative phase. Uh, and then at the very end, as you're moving into um, first in man studies, it's important to understand that you have to be able to have a, a, a therapy or a therapeutic to give to your population, which means you have to get into CGMP manufacturing, which is good manufacturing practices. And that means that, that the products are made in a way that is not going to put the patients at risk. Okay? There's no contaminants or um, byproducts and things like that. Once you have all that information, you must get an IND or an IDE if you're working with a device. And then you still need to develop that clinical protocol before you're going to um, move into phase one studies. All right? So what happens is translational investigators have historically engaged in team science. In other words, they, they kind of pull in the expertise as needed and they, they work together in order to move projects forward. Okay? Because of the expertise that are shown here, um, it's very rare that one person contains the full spectrum of, of knowledge and expertise. So that being said, if you're here, I'm guessing that you're somewhat interested in translational research. So what facilities and equipment and expertise are available to Duke investigators? Where can you tap into these resources? And also, how does an investigator access or learn more about these resources? Um, often in academia, there's tons of resources, but they're disparate, they're not well connected, and they're hard to find and access. 
Okay, so hopefully what I'm going to be doing in the next few slides, by few I mean about 20, is, is go over the broad landscape of resources that we actually do he have here. Um, some of these resources were enabled through DTMI funding. Some of them are already existing. Um, really, our, my hope is to show you the full landscape, um, independent of ownership of, or the institute or center that it belongs to. So um, I first of all also want to make sure that I define how we have um, began to, begun to think of resources and technologies. And that's including facilities and equipment. Everybody thinks of a shared resources, some facility you can go and get some, you know, proteomics analysis done or a microarray analysis done. But we also think of it within DTMI as people, as expertise. It's, it's that, that um, bringing together of the expertise that actually allows the projects to move forward. Okay, so I will go over some of that too. So just to start with DTMI, I'm going to try to grow out from there some of the resources we've been involved with, some of the other at Duke, and then some that are available on, the, on a more global landscape or across the CTSA. Okay, so starting small, <laughs> if you call it small, there are five resources um, that we um, decided to invest in at, at our inception. And those were these five buckets here. And each one had a faculty lead. And Victoria Christian and Bruce Sellinger worked together to recruit project leaders to also enable forward movement within those areas, core leaders. One of the big things that we invested in over the first five years is the MSRB facility, which is commonly called, or what its official title is, is the DTMI CGMP Cell and Molecular Therapeutics Manufacturing Facility, which you can see why we call it the MSRB facility. Um, right now, it is housed in MSRB1, and we have quite the space. But this space was originally developed um, in support of Johannes Wiebig's, um research here at Duke before he left. Um, it was joint developed by, I think, the Department of Surgery and the Brain Tish Robertson Brain Tumor Center. So we stepped in with a, some incremental funding to bring it up to speed and to kind of revive the facility. And what we it's resulted in is two discrete rooms, one on the left called MSRB 247, is a class 100,000 um, preparatory lab. It's a not a gown in, gown out, but it's, it's a clean room. We have regular SOPs and, and we clean the facility on a monthly basis for that room. And it has cryo storage units, it has some specialized pieces of equipment, and it also um, has an aseptic fill area that's being used by Wesley Burks's group. We also have a separate gown in, gown out cell processing suite that has two independent cell labs um, shown on the right. So you enter in through the pre-gowning pre area at the top, you go into the gowning room, you suit up, and then you either enter into cell lab one or cell lab two. And it's a positive pressure from the back out to the front. So it's, it's appropriate for cellular manufacturing, not viral manufacturing, viral vector. So what we, um, and at the bottom here is a list of equipment that we have. The important thing to realize is that um, in order, it's a shared facility. In other words, we provide the infrastructure, we provide the, the monitoring, the SOPs, the, the validation of the instruments, and we operationally manage the facility. Um, I have Dr. Wesley Georgiana here today and Angelique Cosempo who both assist in that. And unfortunately, I don't see um, the op daily manager of the facility, who's Carrie Kamadas. I think she's on a slide here in a second. So if you want to use the facility, these are the kind of specialized equipment we have. And, and take in mind that the facility was originally um, built to support the work in uh, cancer cell vaccine work, where they're taking um, DC preps or apheresis, um, isolating monocytes, and then modifying those monocytes. Um, most of the people we work with electroporate with RNA, so it changes the proteasome, either um, makes them express an antigen on their cell surface that's going to initiate an immune response. Okay? So that's the kind of equipment that we have purchased. So we have a max site scalable transfection system that allows single batch processing, large scale processing of these DC preps. Um, 
We have a Caridium BCT Elutra. Um, this is a, it's a very cool device. It allows you for to uh, efficiently isolate the monocytes from your total PBMC. Okay, and it does it through a counter centrifugation kind of mechanism. It's a really interesting thing. Don't have time, but if you want to learn more, definitely um, contact me. And they also ha we also have a CBS uh, 2100 controlled rate freezer um, that allows us to, after the uh, manipulations and preparations of the products and, and their QC release, that we can store them down uh, for long periods of time. Okay? So one of the big things about being CGMP, though, is your monitoring and CGMP documentation. So we also have um, various kinds of software and programming that allow us to ensure patient safety um, because most of these products that we're manufacturing are autologous cellular products. So there, it's just very, you have to be very careful and there are strict SOPs that you have to go by to ensure that the, um, the, the cellular product is going to the right patient. Okay. Some of our investigators, we've worked with more than this. These are some that I'd like to highlight, though. And um, we are currently working on a new MSRB website, um, as well as a new DTR website with, that we hope to roll out in May. So once that's rolled out, um, if you, these are all three on the website, you can click them and read more about their research and their bios. But we do work um, with Scott Pruitt, um, who's doing an immunotherapy cancer cell vaccine for melanoma. Dr. Paul Jabulix, um has used our facility to do some T-cell expansion work. And also Dr. Wesley Burks, I mentioned him before. He works um, in the aseptic field area for his oral immunotherapy desensitization studies, allergy studies. Right. So this is our facility. That is our team. I already mentioned um, Dr. Georgiana Carey kamanis and Angelique Cosimpa. We have an email address. Um, it's a standard kind of ping. If you're interested in learning more, once again, just email me. I'll send you the slides so you'll have the, e the email address. But just let us know. Um, we have a, the way we manage our users is uh, because of the nature of the facility, you have to be trained before you can use it. So that being said, we're more than willing to train anybody who would like to be trained to use the facility. So all you need to do is email us, um, then we'll set up a time for you to do training. There's some didactic training and there's also some hands-on kind of training where we assess um, whether you know how to clean per the SOPs and things like that. Um, after you pass all that training, you become a registered user. We give you badge access because this is a controlled area. And then you get, um, you have access to the wiki site where you're able to block off and schedule down time in the facility. Right? So, that was one of our huge investments of infrastructure and dollars during the first five years. One of the other things that uh, Dr. Haley worked on, Rebecca Haley, is to establish the Stem Cell Oversight Committee. Um, this was a really crucial thing for Duke University, and it was um, basically, it, the impetus for it was the new uh, regulations passed from the NIH and from the Institute of Medicine um, regulating how stem cells need to be used in an academic environment. So um, participants in this Grove formation, the Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee, um, it was, it's a faculty-led committee, and once again, it was hosted and basically um, really driven. The, the, the inception of it was driven by Dr. Rebecca Haley, who's one of the DTRI project leads. Um, it also has uh, representation from Wes Byerly from the IRB. Wayne, is, Wayne Tommen represents the IBC and Sally Kornbluth to oversee basic science review and interest. And um, right now they're making a lot of progress. They've reviewed um, seven cell-based protocols to date. They have an IBC questionnaire form that's online and available and a website is being set up. And as you can see, Doris Coleman is the point person for this effort. So if you would like to contact Doris, and she's in the back too today. I think we have a lot of people from, from home base here today. Um, then uh, she can probably answer any further questions you have on that. So after about, I guess during year four, we received, or not we, Joanne Kurtzberg received an amazing uh, gift or a funding gift from the Robertson Foundation that really enabled her to expand what she had already built here at Duke with the Cord, uh, Carolina Cord Blood Bank, the Cord Blood Lab, the Stem Cell Labs, okay? 
specifically, that, that money was to support a de novo construction of a second CGMP manufacturing facility upstairs on the ninth floor here in the North Pavilion, um, five clinical trials, and also the formation of a centralized quality assurance group. So, I'm presenting what is supposed to go online. I think I talked to Ana Valverde um, via email yesterday. In June, they're going to start taking um, projects. And notice that it's hard to see here, but it has a research lab here, a materials prep lab, and then you can enter into the more GMP gown in, gown out space. This is a, is a much more complex, hot, more highly regulated space than the MSRB, and it's really appropriate for phase one and two studies. And what it enables to do, there's a, one large lab that's going to be supporting the ongoing efforts of the um, Joanne Kurtzberg's group, but there's also two other cell labs that just like the MSRB, you can become trained, you can access the lab, and you can register for time in the lab. Both of those facilities are set up as a shared resource. Um, I'm not from, I know if you're familiar with the shared resource policies, but it really boils down to you're getting an excellent resource at the bare minimum cost just to over, you know, recover overhead and ongoing expenses. So that being said, Ana Valverda, <laughs> Um, sitting here is, is the contact person regarding the Robertson Foundation. And any questions you have, whether it's facilities um, or whether it's uh, about the integration, what the funding is enabling, or um, just getting access and learning more about um, on the ongoing efforts within that group. So the quality group, that's the other thing. There were also five clinical projects, but in the effort of maybe staying on time. We won't be touching on those today. But the quality group I did want to mention because of the fact that it's a, it's a great resource for people who are, want to have some consulting or, or have a, a person or a group to ping some ideas off of with regards to quality assurance, quality control. Um, it, it was, the group was being, the infrastructure is being supported by the Robertson Foundation and it's a, a being led by Dr. Rebecca Haley. Um, she would be your point person for any questions or more information regarding um, this group. Currently, they are um, in doing internal audits of the cord, Carolina Core Blood Bank, the Core Blood Lab, and moving on to the Stem Cell Lab. She works uh, very closely with Doris Coleman and um, many others. And they're trying to make sure that all the protocols are, are compliant and everything is in place. So. That was our focus for the first five years in cell and cellular therapies. As you can see, though, at the first five, top five buckets were those original five we said we were going to invest in. What that really broke down into was that middle row. In other words, when we say combinatorial chemistry and molecular therapies, um, it's both, right? Cell and tissue, we, we kind of broke out into stem cell and regenerative and cell therapy, traditional cell therapies. Um, and so on and so forth down the line. So if you look at what I've discussed so far, it's really just the efforts within those, that, that targeted area shown here. In reality, if you're looking for resources to enable the translation of a product, project or a product, then it takes almost the entire continuum of resources. Okay, it's, it's although you might need the CGMP lab, you're probably going to need some omic studies if you want to do any mechanistic studies. You might need um, the immune monitoring lab to do some analysis for you. You might want to do some imaging. And in addition to that, by a repository, you're probably definitely going to want to do some biobanking of your clinical samples. So it's important to understand that although we have focused energy in cell and molecular and we've done discrete things, it's really important to know the entire spectrum of what's available. Beyond that, it's not just about those five things. In the original diagram I put up, we indicated that we had this kind of cross-cutting bioinformatics or project leadership roles that were internally in the DTRI project office. What we found was we are growing in other ways to help support projects, whether it's funding, you know, projects need clinical protocol design, Projects need um, advice and consulting on intellectual property and licensing. And almost every project that's going through a transla translation into first in man studies needs some regulatory expertise. Okay? So that being said, what 
came about was this idea of the DTRI project office, and which is really a group of people. It's the, it's the people that work at DTRI and an awareness of the landscape of resources available. And it's really a portal or a touch point or an investigator access point to which you can find out more about all these different resources. So while it's important to understand, yeah, there's a CGMP lab going in upstairs that's going to allow you to make your cellular products, it's important to have a place where at the point in time you decide or you recognize that you need biobanking, who to go to. So that's why we created this concept of the project office. And it basically brings together a bunch of expertise. And beyond that, it's, it's a centralized awareness of what's out there. So it's just an entry point for investigators. There we have a standardized email address. It's at the top, DTRI Project Office at mc.duke.edu. And here's a list of uh, and staff, personnel within that office in relevant areas of expertise. And as you can see, we can internally field most of the questions, and if we can't, we know where to go externally to get the answers. Um, this chart right here will be available and on our new DTRI website under the project office link, so you will be able to get to this information much easier in the future. So in the meantime, you can um, easily always contact the DTRI project office uh, via email, and um, we will defer the, the question to the appropriate person. So I also mentioned that beyond the project office, we kind of have learned that we need all these other expertise. Sometimes it made more sense, rather than hiring a discrete person to come in and fill the shoes, to identify existing people and expertise around and within our community in order to be able to resource things out to them. Okay, so one of those things is the DTMI regulatory group shown here. Um, this is an internal DTMI group, um, not directly under in the DTRI project office, any kind of operational plan, but we work very closely with them. And almost every single project I work on, I have a point person within the DTMI project or the uh, DTMI regulatory group that, that consults me and consults the, uh, with me and the investigators as the best approach to how to move things forward. Um, I also want to mention that they do have uh, some regulatory services at, in and of their own. They have an IND IDE preparation and maintenance service. It's free of charge. You just need to contact them if you're interested in doing or submitting an IND. Um, they have strategic program development and support. And they also have some educational initiatives, including these seminars. I think they give once a semester on how to um, write an IRB you know, protocol, how to submit an IND, what does it mean to submit an IND and IDE. So I, if you're interested in translational research, I would um, suggest that you contact them because they could be a great resource for you. Um, now moving on to the DCRU, which is kind of the flagship of some of the, the great that are happening um, within the DTMI. And basically what it is, is it's a phase one unit that allows, um, the, provides a unique model for the conduct of early phase clinical research and accelerates the development of new medical therapies. Um, specifically, it's housed over in Duke South. And I have three of the people who are here today who were gracious enough to provide me with information I'm going to try to, to read to you now. Um, there's a 13,000 square foot unit, three, and this is just the pediatric um, early phase unit. There's two parts. There's an adult and a pediatrics unit. Um, three proof of concept dormitory rooms, six pediatric beds, 10 licensed hospital beds, hospital beds including two infant family rooms, uh, permit standard of care services, and outpatient facilities with three infusion chairs. Okay. They also have the adult unit. The big thing here is that it's a 30-bed adult confinement unit with all kinds of analytical um, expertise and capabilities built into the facility. The types of studies they do are listed here. Um, they do phase one to phase 2A studies, but once again, one of their, their feathers in their hat is the ability to do high-end analytical work and um, specimen processing in-house built into the infrastructure. So 
this is one of the, the examples of some of the uh, work that's gone through there. I did not highlight, and I should have, that um, I know through talking with Lou that uh, there's an ongoing um, relationship with Celgene, which is a, a cell, cell-based company to support their phase one studies. Um, but in addition, they're doing rhinovirus challenge and model validation studies. And the reason I put this up, because it, it shows kind of one of the really, um, I don't want to say novel or innovative, but there's only one phase one unit in the U.S. that currently has the capability to do this study, and it's here at Duke. So having that, you know, kind of capabilities right here um, is a tremendous asset to our investigator community. So um, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, DCRU points of contact. Once again, um, you should contact Barry Mangum. He's the Director of Clinical Pharmacology and Business Development. And also Donna Hamill, who I could not find a photo of her online. <laughs> so, um, intellectual property patenting and licensing. Once again, this is something that we did hire or we have um, contracted with a legal expert, um, Carla Otterson, who does a lot of contract negotiations, MTAs, CDAs, all those kinds of things for us in-house. But we rely heavily on a, on a relationship with the Office of Licensure and Ventures here. Um, and Rose Ritz is the executive director of that. She's um, very approachable and would be happy to meet with anybody if you have any questions regarding IP licensing issues. So I suggest that you give her a call or send her an email. Now, the co next couple of slides I'm going to click through really quickly because I just want to make sure that I'm including all the resources at your disposal. To go through the list of every single one of these would, would take more than an hour alone. But I, there are other institutes and centers on campus that have built resources that could be very valuable to a translational researcher doing T1 research. Okay, so the IGS, um, I'm sorry, the Duke Cancer Institute um, Shared Resource Network has these. There's a web trust at the top. They have a wonderful website. Um, if you want the slides, once again, send me an email. I'll send them to you. These are all direct hyperlinked, so you can get to them. Um, the IGSP Shared Resources, same thing. Tons of wonderful resources. And also the DHVI Shared Resource Center. Um, has a lot of great resources um, for investigators to access. Um, I do have a picture here. Greg Sempowski is the scientific director of DHVI, um, and he's a great point of contact if you have any questions or want to learn more about how to access some of the things they offer. So um, now that I've kind of shown you all the resources, or at least surveyed some of the resources that are available here, I do want to mention that because we're part of the CTSA in the consortium, there are also initiatives um, between institutions to be able to come up with inventorying of all the CTSA resources. And Dr. Jesse Tenenbaum, shown here on the bottom right, was part of one of these initiatives. In fact, uh, you can tell from the first author pool on there that she was a big part of one of these initiatives. And what they created is, this is a screenshot of it, it's called the Resource Discovery System. Up at the top is the email address, but it's a collaboration. It contains more than 1,500 shared resources or investigator resources across the CTSA. It's a queryable search engine. So if we don't have what you need here, this would be the next place to look. Okay? And it's a great resource to find out what maybe UNC has because that's another CTSA institution, or even further out, if you want to collaborate with somebody at MD Anderson or Harvard or Stanford, you can go online and see their resources. Okay. The other thing that um, we are moving towards beyond just the CTSA, but this idea of um, proof of concept, um, proof of principle, proof of mechanism networks. Okay. So the global network um, is being started in large part, I think, it'd be an initiative of DCRU in collaboration with Medanta in uh, India and also the Singapore Investigational Medicine Unit, or IMU. The idea between this 
particular proof of concept network is um, that they can offer a large, larger ethnic diversity in your phase one, phase two, and even phase three studies so that you can more effectively gauge if, um, how your therapy will, to, will um, interact in different patient populations. And so you can see on the far left is Duke, um, not very diverse here. But if you com combine that between a multi-center trial that includes Duke, Delhi, and Singapore, then you have a lot more data to pull from. So the Duke POC network strengths, there are a lot of them. It makes sense in a lot of ways to do this. Um, reduce operational variability, recruitment speed, reduced cost. I think, I think it was, and I'm pulling off re recollection here, but I think it's 40 to 60 percent reduction in cost in, um, in India and a 20 to 40 percent in Singapore over the standard U.S. clinical trial. Um, thought leadership in-house, global subject matter expertise, range of capabilities and technologies, leveraging those expertise at each individual place and call, bringing them together as a centralized access. Um, global social responsibility. Uh, multiple global environments and uh, gene pool exposure. And for some reason, I lost a beautiful picture here. We had a little bit of problem in my slides this morning. It had a, somehow a virus attached to it when I tried to send it in. Um, so clinical and translational science center, we're also developing an additional site in Brazil. And Renato Lopez, who is uh, seated about midway down here in the back, is really the one driving this um, and has been instrumental in building um, the, D the BCRI, or Brazilian Clinical Research Institute, and in obtaining funding from the federal government in Brazil, uh, $20 million, in order to build um, DTMI South, or BTMI. Ah, oh, it just was on a delay. So you can see here, this is a campus representation. In the far left building is the site. So, to create um, an academic and organizational home for initiatives of translational science, synergistic basic science and clinical research, establish an integrative and cross-disciplinary environment. You can continue to read these, but they're going to sound very familiar if you're familiar with the DTMI mission, because it's really the same goal, is to bring together infrastructure and, and capabilities and expertise in order to um, be able to leverage some of this research that's being done in Brazil and bring it up and help it uh, translate into clinical studies and also as a collaborative partner of DTMI to once again and this POC or POM or whatever proof of con uh, network have yet another patient population to be able to tap into. It's doing funny things. Okay. So, building a home for translational medicine in Brazil. This is the building. Um, once again, there's a $20 million grant from the federal government that's going to enable this. It's an 11-story building. Um, it's going to house everything from imaging, uh, reception and meeting rooms, clinical research, informatics, genomics, molecular pathology, uh, proteomics, and cell co culture and tissue and cell banking. So. I think I still have 20 minutes, so I talk faster than I thought, um, I, which is good, because I want to spend the next 20 minutes going over, I won't, I won't say it's, a, it's the epitome of, of the translational research that's being done here. It's representative of some of the research that's being done in this arena. There's a great number of, um, of um, great investigators in this arena here at Duke. And this is uh, not meant to be all-inclusive, but only representative. So with that disclaimer, um, I would like to highlight a little bit of the work that John Sampson on the left and uh, Dwayne Mitchell shown here on the right are doing in developing and testing innovative therapeutic platforms for the treatment of um, glioblastoma. Um, through working with them, I've learned that I should... I first thought they, they were just doing cancer cell vaccines, but it's not the case. They're really trying to push the limit as how to um, 
innovate around ways to target glioblastoma. And one of those are, uh, is autologous cell vaccines. Um, another is peptide-based vaccines. Um, they're also using antibody-based approaches. And it's not just that simple. We're traditionally in cell vaccines, we're using uh, DC cells that are uh, electroporated, once again, with RNA or peptide, and we're changing their proteasome. That, so they um, display some kind of antigen. They're even taking it one step further where they're now exploring ideas of using retroviral vectors, ex vivo, and autologous cell therapies to be able to terminally differentiate and to have a propagated uh, a germ cell line from after they're reintroduced into the patient. So then I also want to talk about some of the work being done by Chris Contos, uh, Don Bowles, and Carmela Milano. Um, I chose this because it's some of the viral vector work that's going on here at Duke, um, or gene therapy. What they're trying to do is use an uh, A, AV or adeno-associated virus kind of construct to deliver P10 um, ex vivo during coronary artery bypass grafting. So after they harvest the saphenous vein from the leg, leg, they basically perfuse it with this vector-based solution, rinse it out, so they move all the residual virus, and then use that for the coronary artery bypass. And what they're seeing is that this, this viral vector in the P10 expression is able to reduce the amount of intimal hyperplasia. So they're getting coronary artery bypass grafts that are, are uh, the effic efficacy is longer. Um, and this is in mouse studies. They're now moving to dog studies. And they um, just submitted an SBIR grant with AskBio, which is a local company. Um, it's a spin out from UNC's uh, Jutes Molsky's lab there. Um, in order to take this and move it into phase one trials. I also want to highlight some work that uh, is being done closer to home here in the DCRI um, between what Rich, Rick Becker, I don't want to call him Richard, Rick Becker and Bruce Sullinger. Um, Sullinger uh, is in the back today, um, and I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you more about this um, after we wrap. But um, really what they're trying to do is develop and translate reversible antithrombotic and anticoagulation agents, and particularly for the acute care and perioperative setting. Um, the basic premise is that you have an RNA-based aptamer that has been evolved to target a, a certain protein or, or um, enzyme or whatever that's effective in the, uh, the cascade. And that agent when delivered um, can be easily reversed by administering of a complementary antidote molecule. Okay? So the, the caveat and the, and the innovation I think around this is more not just, it's not just another antithrombotic or anticoag um, kind of agent, but it's one that can be modified and fine-tuned and which is very important in PCI and other um, clinical settings. So um, I do want to say that the team has just completed a phase 2B clinical trial called RADAR, 800 patients undergoing PCI at over 80 sites around the world. And it was presented at American Heart. Uh, in eight years, the research team that was assembled has translated a drug antidote pair from conception through phase 1 and through two, phase 2A two and 2B large population studies, which is quite an achievement in eight years. Now, because I was hoping we would have time, and we do, I want to spend a little bit more time on this particular project and the work being done by Smina Nair and Scott Pruitt. And the reason why is because I think that they are an ex excellent example of innovators who have utilize those resources available to them in our environment to move their project forward and to expedite things. Um, the collaborators, D Dave Butchkowski and Jens Denal, Dave works in, with Smita and Jens works with Dr. Pruitt, also Dave Snyder, who does a lot of the animal work, and Rebecca Haley, once again, has been instrumental from uh, regulatory support and, and um, those kind of things for, for this project team. And um, also they have utilized other uh, 
resources available through the TTRI, which I'll go through in a second. Um, for example, the CGMP cell and molecular processing suite. So I'm going to attempt these slides were provided to me by them. Once again, I'm going to do my best to try to uh, do this science justice. Um, but there is some D this a DC-based therapy, and this is a traditional schematic of a DC cell-based therapy, where you have a patient um, and you identify RNA, tumor RNA, from that patient, and it's amplified, okay, so that you have then a, a the transcriptome of 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 the patient's tumor type, the discrete transcriptome of that type of um, tumor. At the same time. You have the patient and you do a leukophoresis, and those cells um, are either elutriated or put on some kind of cell separation device, like a Clinimax, where monocytes are isolated, and then they're get, in culture they are matured, or they are uh, given growth factors that allow them to mature into immature DCs. At which time you take the cells that you've isolated and you take your RNA and you combine them. And the way you get the RNA in is through one of these electroporation devices, which basically punches little holes in the cell surface and the RNA goes in. After that time, you culture them again, allow them to heal, and you give them more growth factors, and they mature into full DCs. At that point, they are either stored, um, or usually they're aliquoted out into multiple doses, and some are stored, and some are given, you know, starting to get back to the patient on whatever clinical regimen they're on. Okay, so that being said, there's been a lot of, of successes within this. There's been um, multiple phase one, two studies um, that have been completed. And the conclusions based on those studies really that the vaccine generates tumor specific immune responses, which is the goal, but it's, it got under, it's of modest clinical benefit to the patient. So then the key question was, to Smita and, and Scott was how can we improve the therapeutic benefit of these RNA transfected DCs? Okay. So their approach was to locally deliver immune modulating proteins using RNA transfected cells, for example, antibodies. So on the left here, it shows that you have your immunotherapy, which is this DC cell vaccine that's been electroporated here with MART um, or TRP2 that then express these on their cell surface. At the same time, you would deliver a DC transfected with an antibody, either GITR or CTLA-4, that would effectively, if I can get this to go, increase the tumor immune response, okay? This is just shown in a schematic here where you have CTA, GITR or CTLA-4 activation would then increase T cell proliferation, cytokine production, memory T cell survival, and effectively increase the tumor immune response. So what they found when they started doing investigational studies that they, is that by blocking the CTLA-4 receptor, they found that they had enhanced T cell responses. But the problem became um, apparent when they systemically delivered these antibodies or agents that were blocking the receptor. Um, they had some toxic, toxic effects upon systemic administration. At the same time, they, effect, they were looking at the GITR ligand. And basically, they learned that if you stimulate GITR, that you enhance T cell response. But once again, they came into a little bit of a problem when looking at systemic delivery. They found that it was associated with an autoimmune response. So they came up with an approach that would allow them to do a local administration of the um, GITR and CTLA-4 so that they could achieve the therapeutic benefits but not have to uh, incur all the systemic complications. So we have a localized delivery using antibody secreting DCs. So now they do two DCs preps. They do a DC prep that encodes their tumor antigen. They do another DC prep that is making these GITR and CTLA-4 and excreting them in the local media, into the, the cytosome. So, thus, two to three nanograms of locally deliver, uh, delivered antibody is comparable to 10 to the 6 nanograms of systemic delivered antibody. If, you're, if, if you do clinical research, this in and of itself is a huge win because of the cost of goods factor. You now can do a study and with a, a, 
a micro amount of agent as it took to do the same endpoint before. They also didn't see any of the complications that they saw with the systemic delivery um, when they were doing local administration. So in the end, once again, they decided to go with a dual approach where they have a tumor immunotherapy and immune modulation therapy at the same time. They designed a clinical approach um, in which we, they had an anti or ag, a antagonistic CTLA-4 and an anti-getter that was agonistic, once again, to stimulate and repress res, or repress and stimulate respectively. Also, they wanted to augment the anti-tumor immune responses using local immune modulator delivery while avoiding systemic autoimmunity. That was the key. Um, they have a clinical trial designed here in which all patients received the um, tumor immunotherapy, which is the one encoding for the, the um, MART or the TRP2. And then different arms or cohorts were given no RNA, um, meaning the Gitter CTLA-4, Gitter fusion only combination, um, or just the CTLA-4 only. So right now, they have designed this clinical trial. They have endpoints designed primary for the safety and toxin, also secondary, um, to do a little bit of efficacy testing. And what they really need, they've checked all the boxes, is they're looking for funding. So that's where the project now sits. Why I want to, again, highlight this project is because of the next two slides. And that's how they effectively tapped into resources available to them as, as being part of the Duke investigator community. Um, for example, they worked with um, Rebecca Haley and the DTMI regulatory group extensively um, to, to file RAC applications. They're approved. Uh, IND applications submitted and approved. Clinical IRB study protocols approved. At the same time, they um, worked with DTRI to acquire the equipment they needed from a manufacturing standpoint. Um, they also have received, pilot, or they now work with the MSRB facility, which is the first facility we discussed, to be able to manufacture these um, agents. And the mRNA that they're actually transfecting the cells with and the autologous cell products themselves. Both are manufactured in the suite. At the same time, they have effectively competed for um, DTMI-based funding opportunities that allowed them to do the work that, you, that enabled their um, IRB, their IND, and everything else. They've been the recipient of a pilot program grant, um, which is $100,000, and they've also been the recipient of a voucher program, which allows them around 20 k to be able to access the MSRB facility. All in all, they not only just used DTMI, they sought out other support. They uh, aligned with the Duke Brain Tumor Immunotherapy Program, the Melanoma Consortium, and also the NI, they um, are competing for, excuse me, for R21 funding um, that application is under review currently. So with that being said, I hope that, I hope that you learned a little bit about uh, what resources are available to uh, facilitate your, your research here. Um, and I hope that you were inspired a little by the work that some of the investigators are doing in this, in this area. Um, I know I'm inspired. Um, I feel very fortunate to work with this group of investigators and, and with the DTRI. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, please uh, feel free to contact me. Or once again, you can always email the DTRI project office. And once again, we hope to have a new website that's going to go live. I think the target for that is in May 2011. Um, so next month, and hopefully on the new website, it will be really easy to find all this kind of information and on contacts that you need to move your, your um, research forward. So, can't manage, I can't believe I actually managed to get through 69 slides in under an hour.
Um, I, well, I think the, the, the larger your portfolio, like I said, from the DCRI standpoint, um, obviously you're doing uh, more clinically relevant things where this is more basic science or, or translational science or mechanistic studies. A lot of the resources that I've highlighted um, are proteomics or microarray or uh, gene sequencing, things like that. Um, I think that there, if you have an a industry partner that has already decided exactly what they need, um, if that involves some uh, mechanistic or characterization of the, of, um, the clinical you know, endpoints and, or um, samples, then I think that you should um, go to the DTRI project office. Because once again, if we cannot, um, if we do not, do not internally have the expertise, we're probably a good source to know to, as a way to determine if the, if the expertise are here or if the resource is here. I also think there is a cultural shift that needs to, well, I won't say what that needs to happen, that can happen when an industry sponsor comes um, to somewhere like the DCRI or the DCRU and they want XYZ and they don't really want to understand anything else. Sometimes it's just a matter of, of um, knowing the portfolio of resources that are available and maybe um, articulating the value of some of these additional studies to the industry sponsor, especially small pharma. They, um, they might not, this, a lot of times these small, smaller pharma, small startup companies don't under, this is all new territory for them, right? They have been told that they need to do X, Y, and Z. So they're going to come and say, I need to do X, Y, and Z. But they don't understand the value of seeing these small incremental studies that be, can be done here at Duke that can um, basically provide a lot of more understanding for them as they move the trial from a phase one or a phase two into a phase three and able them to um, tweak protocols to be able to, to meet their endpoints later down the road.